Hello, world. Squirrel here. <laughs> Giampolo, G I'm not sure I can say your name. Giampaolo. Hello. Yes, I am here. Uh, someone is out here. Uh, just doing a little technical setup here. I'm, I'm normally in my 600-year-old house at home, uh, but I'm traveling today, and I happen to sit down in an office that had a whiteboard, and I'm going to be talking about architectures and diagrams and all kinds of wonderful things like that. So I thought I'd try writing on it. So uh, I hope you can all see it. And uh, a couple folks are telling me they can hear me, at least on YouTube, which is great. Uh, if you can't hear me, tell me. Uh, I'm not sure how you'd know. But uh, glad to see uh, several folks coming along for uh, a chat about architecture uh, and all things um, confusing diagrams. I've tried to create a uh, confusing diagram up here, which we'll uh, look at together uh, in some depth, uh, as well as a way to think about diagrams. So we'll come to all that. But first of all, hello to you, whether you're here live or you're on the recording. Uh, if you're, uh, oh, yeah, John Paolo says, I am great. I'm glad to hear it. Um, if you're on the recording, um, you can't ask me questions now, but you can ask me on the Squirrel Squadron forum, which I'll explain in a second, um, or just by emailing me. And if you're here live, would you please, uh, as John Paolo and Julia have both done, uh, just say hello and tell me also, both of you and, and, and everybody else there, uh, tell me what brought you here. What made you interested in this topic? Because um, although you can't uh, jump in and speak as, as we do in my Zoom sessions that I have, uh, I really would like to make sure I'm responsive to your questions that you tell me um, uh, what's most important to you. I'm much better interactively. I'm much better if I, uh, am I, I'm working off the cuff. So uh, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, why are you here? Uh, while you're writing down for me uh, what brought you here and what questions you have, please do that. Um, I'm Squirrel, if you don't know that. Uh, this is the Squirrel Squadron, if you don't know that. The Squirrel Squadron is my way of giving back to all the wonderful people, uh, hundreds of organizations now, I think it's over 300, that I've worked with in the last uh, eight or nine years as a consultant, helping technology teams become insanely profitable. And uh, the uh, squadron includes a whole bunch of different things, uh, and they're all free, uh, and they're aimed at executives just like you who are interested in uh, what's going on in technology. Either you're on the technology side trying to explain diagrams like this, to, to people who don't understand them and get confused by them, or you're trying to get new resources, you're trying to try new things and you're, you're having a challenge with that, or you're on the non-technical side. We've got a lot of folks like that who come along and say, man, this technology is amazing. You know, I can get ChatGPT to order pizza for me. This is an incredible um, uh, new world and I need some help. I need to understand how to get the right things out of my engineers. Uh, you know, I just read an email from a, a CEO in Africa that I'm working with saying how frustrated she is that her engineers aren't engaged with her customers. Well, this is the kind of problem that we work on uh, in the Squirrel Squadron. So you're at the right place if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in. Uh, so uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the Squadron, and then we'll dive right into uh, software architecture. Uh, the first is that uh, we have the uh, Insanely Profitable Tech Newsletter. Just gave it a new name last week, uh, but I've been, it's been going for a couple of years now. Uh, and I just got two really nice uh, responses, people saying this is fantastic, new ideas, um, really stimulating. That's what I aim for. Uh, I, I hope I hit it most weeks, uh, but I have new ideas, new uh, thinking about how technology might work. Here's a preview for Monday. I'm going to be talking about two new, at least two new technologies that I think you could use right away. Uh, that could make a real difference in your productivity, whether or not you are a geek or not. Um, and uh, that's the sort of thing I write about each week. We have events just like this, uh, free live streams, free Zoom calls, uh, which are for executive folks only, um, where we get a little more uh, interactive. So uh, we have one of those coming up uh, just in a couple of weeks. We have an amazing guest, uh, Joanna Rothman, author of like 20 books on how to manage a software team. Really uh, personable uh, accessible, understandable ideas from Joanna. So I'm really looking forward to talking with her. Uh, and then uh, uh, after that, we have uh, how, to, uh, how to deal with an out of control engineer. That was something the community came up with and said, Squirrel, you got to talk about this. So I'm not sure what I'm going to say, but I've met a lot of out of control engineers and I have a lot of ideas about what you can do, both to get better control and actually to make use of them. So, because uh, they can be really productive, used right. So uh, that's uh, events coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we also have the Squirrel Squadron Forum I mentioned, so uh, tons of discussions going on over there. Um, uh, we just had a back and forth on, um, uh, what was it on? It was on, um, oh man, it's gone out of my head, but it was with our, our Australian friends. We had the, oh, it was on atomic design. Julia was contributing some ideas from uh, the government data service in Britain. Uh, we have uh, uh, some product folks in uh, Australia who've used this idea of uh, atomic design to design better software and better uh, user experiences. 
Um, so uh, chatting to some of those folks uh, over on the forum. So if you're interested in design, if you're interested in uh, uh, process, better processes for software, if you're interested in current events, you know what's going on with the Apple Vision Pro, for example. Uh, we're discussing all of those uh, different topics on the Squirrel Squadron forum. And all this stuff is free. Why is it free? It's free because I love giving things back and I love having a community that gives me wonderful ideas uh, that I can then uh, expand on with you, which is what I'm about to do. And, and by the way, this topic was another one coming from the community. People said, what do we do with all these crazy art diagrams? How do we make sense of them? That's what we're gonna be talking about here today. Uh, John Polo says, I'm curious about how you present the concepts, something about communication and stakeholders management. Well, I'm certainly going to be talking about that, especially in John Polo says, he, uh, he I think maybe she, I can't tell, uh, is a lead engineer. English is stupid. You have to say he or she. I think that's dumb. Okay, more folks. Uh, um, it, says, is anybody out there? Uh, I can see lots of you are out there. Please uh, go to your comments section and ask me questions. Tell me what you want me to talk about. John Polo has already told me that. Uh, I'm going to make sure to, I was already planning to, but I'm going to emphasize more on communications and stakeholders, which I'm always talking about, as you guys know. Uh, but uh, please tell me more that you'd like me to talk about and argue with me. Uh, tell me, hey, wait, that won't work for me. That doesn't make sense in my organization. My, or my diagrams are not that simple. That would be fantastic. I'd like to hear argument and discussion. Uh, that's when we get more out of this. By the way, I should also mention I have, I'm have i going to get booted out of this office um, a little bit before the official hour is up. So get your questions in now uh, before um, uh, I might uh, somebody might turn off all the lights on me here. So we'll see how that all goes. But we got at least uh, 45 minutes more. Uh, uh, to, to discuss all of these topics if, if we have enough going. Right, so I'm gonna start with something that's not technological. I'm gonna start with an analogy. I'm gonna start with something you probably know better. Um, if you're doing anything in a company at any kind of uh, management level, you have probably encountered a different group of people who are just as confusing as us engineers, but you kind of know how to deal with them. And I'm gonna suggest you deal with us engineers in the same way as you're used to dealing with uh, with these people. And they're, they're called finance people. Um, and they're in charge of doing things like paying your salary. They're kind of important. Um, and they're in charge of making sure that, uh, say, the investor's funds are tracked properly, that uh, you have the right cash flow forecasts and balance sheets, and you file your taxes. Um, and, and they do all that stuff really, really uh, effectively, but in their own jargon and in their own sort of confusing and uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, a technical way, in the same way us technologists build what we build in, in a more complicated way than, than perhaps we need to. Um, but the finance folks do something us engineers are not nearly so good at. So anytime you read a board pack or an annual report or uh, anything that has a balance sheet in it or a cash flow statement or uh, income projection, all of those kinds of things, which frankly put me to sleep, I have to say. They're, they're really hard to make sense of. They're rows and rows of numbers. I'm a mathematician. I love numbers. But man, these are hard to make it through. But there's something the finance people do that really helps. They have a narrative. So every time you read one of those, you may already be in this habit. If you're not, you definitely should be. Every time you look at one of those graphs or charts or, or balance sheets, you look at the bottom or off to the side. And what you find is a nice little narrative that says something like, um, we need to land at least one of our five uh, pipeline uh, sales um, uh, opportunities, uh, or we're not going to make our projections for the quarter. Uh, and also, uh, we need to control costs, and as a, uh, in, in order to do that, we're going to be closing our factory in Singapore or something like that. And, and that information is in the balance sheet, it's in the cash statements, in whatever the, uh, the numbers are, but it's hidden. And it's really only in finance and language. But there's a translation. So isn't it wonderful that these, these wonderful finance people with their same kind of jargon, same kind of complexity that, that us engineers do, they've somehow evolved this ability to, to talk about it. We're not as good at that. You might need to help us, us engineers. We're, we're, we're not as good at conversations. I wrote a whole book on how to talk to engineers and how engineers can talk to other people more effectively called Agile Conversations, but you don't need to read my book. You can just suggest to the engineers that they talk you through it, which is something we're going to do. I'm going to talk you through this diagram that's up here and, uh, uh, do, and uh, encourage you with the sorts of things you should be asking and the sorts of things you can find out very quickly um, from any kind of diagram like this. So the most impo important thing, if you take nothing else away, and this is to John Polo's point about communication and stakeholders, if you're a stakeholder or if you're on the engineering side and you're trying to communicate this sort of information, make sure there's a narrative and it's written like a story. Uh, and you'll see that. I'm going to give you an example of what that story sounds like, but it should have a beginning and a middle and an end. It should have a plot. It should have uh, some, some drama to it. You know, If we don't make these sales, we will have to uh, uh, miss our numbers for the quarter. 
that's got drama in it, right? It's got a kind of arc. It goes up to the worry about what's not going to happen. Then, then you can imagine, oh, yes, we'll better make the sales, so we better do something. You have that feeling of a narrative. You want the same thing. Hard to do in technology, but I'm going to show you how. Uh, Ryan says, my book is amazing. Okay. Is the Squirrel Squadron forum for execs only? Yes, it is. Um, so, uh, Ryan, I haven't figured out a way to give the privacy to, to uh, executives that they need. They don't really want to be talking to recruiters and uh, investors and people who work for them. They, they want to be talking really to each other uh, and, and also give um, options for, for folks who aren't execs. So if you're not an exec yet, forum's not for you, but you're absolutely welcome to come along here. And, and uh, Ryan, you've mentioned to me before that it would be good if we could find something for people who are not executives but want to be. Um, keep bugging me about that. I'm really glad that you, you bring that up and please keep telling me. I'm not there yet, but it's something that I would like to do. Uh, I focus on executives because that's the sort of people that I work with most and who I can give the most benefit to. But lots of people can learn. Many of you who are here who aren't uh, uh, learn the same sorts of things as you advance toward being an executive. I like to help you too, which is why there are free live streams. Okay, so um, now I want to teach you something very important, which I did not originate. Uh, this comes from a very clever guy called Andrew Hollow, uh, who does a strategy for loads of different nonprofits and governmental organizations, very different from what I do. Um, but I learned tons from him because he, he's such a, a, a great analyst. So he can take, say, um, the United Nations um, mission to eradicate a disease in Africa or something like that. That's the sort of thing he does. He's just uh, visiting Nairobi, I think, and, and um, do, doing a lot there uh, with uh, a, a UN group of that kind. And he can draw for them a diagram of their organization that gives them huge insights. And it's really, really helpful. And um, by drawing a lot of diagrams, quite an analytical person, he has developed something called Andrew's uh, Arrow Axiom. That was my name for it. He, he just told me what it was. And then I said, we need a name. It's going to be Andrew's Arrow Axiom. And, and let me illustrate it. So I've drawn this diagram here, and there aren't any arrows. There's nothing that tells you how the different pieces interact with each other. I'll go through the details uh, with you, uh, so don't worry. Um, and I know it's a little bit fuzzy. This isn't a perfect organization here. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to be reading out what's on here. So, if, And you certainly, uh, won't, I don't expect you to know what any of the acronyms mean. That's okay. We're going to go through that. But I'm just using it as an illustration of the sort of thing that an engineer might draw for you on a whiteboard like this and say, you know what we really need is more of these app servers. We need to get more of these things here in the middle. Don't agree with them until they have taken you through how these different boxes interact with each other. That's the arrow axiom. A diagram with no arrows is missing half of the information because there has to be something dynamic happening. We don't just build pieces of software that sit there and do nothing. We have to have a human being. There's a human being over there. They're very important. Doing something and getting something out. There has to be some input and output. But lots of engineers forget to illustrate this. They don't include that in their narrative. So um, follow the arrow axiom by making sure that if there's something that's kind of isolated, and made up, I've exaggerated here, I've drawn no arrows, and I'm going to draw them in for you. But um, uh, it, it could be that the engineer draws some of this, and they get some of the arrows, and they, some of the dy dynamics is noticeable. And they say, hey, this guy's hanging out here. How's, how's this one connected to anybody else? What, what do I do with this? How does something come in? How does something go out? What does it do? And if you don't get a clear answer, then that's going to be a red flag for you. So um, let me uh, uh, describe a little bit. Um, how you can think about the complexity of the diagram before you even understand anything. So if you're just looking at the diagram and you have a narrative from it, so you might get the engineer to write something down for you about how it's used, you don't have to understand anything to apply the rules in here because um, we can have that, hey, I'm a consultant. Of course, I have to make two by two matrices. Um, there's a diagram that could be simple or complex. This is quite a simple diagram. If you've ever seen architecture diagrams, just search on Google if you want to see some complicated ones. Um, you can see ones that cover whole pages and have uh, tiny little um, uh, items, uh, tiny little boxes all over the place, um, uh, tons and tons of microservices and other things. That would be a complex one. This one's relatively simple. So you can rate yourself on whether your diagram is simple or complex without understanding anything. You don't have to know what any of it is. Just are there a lot of pieces? Are those pieces um, relatively coherent? Are they grouped into smaller pieces? Uh, groups uh, of some kind, or they kind of scattered all over the map. And, and that's something you can uh, just use your eyes to, to discover. Um, the, then there's also the narrative. How simple or complex is the narrative? So I gave you a very simple uh, financial narrative, right? The um, If we don't make our sales, then we will run out of money. Okay, that's one's very, very simple to understand. 
It turns out this diagram also has a very simple narrative, which I'm going to go through with you. But if I told you that this uh, diagram actually involves uh, 47 different services, which are uh, orchestrated together with a complex um, design, uh, and um, uh, they're running uh, uh, on a number of different platforms around the globe and so on, and that the, my narrative is quite lengthy and, and uses a lot of jargon and is complicated, then you would say, ah, that's, that's in the complex um, end of the narrative. So if you can rate yourself on both of those without understanding anything, you've already discovered something very important about the architecture. Because um, if the narrative is simple and the diagram is simple, you've got a good match. That's, that's, you're probably looking pretty good there. I would not worry too much because you've got something that's appropriately not too complicated doing something that isn't too complicated. But there's uh, two really dangerous ones here. If the narrative is simple, hey, uh, all we do is we serve images of, of cute cats to people who come to us on the inter internet. Um, yeah, but the uh, diagram is very complicated. We're doing huge amounts of caching and we're uh, storing things in multiple clouds and the whole uh, uh, design is uh, very hard to understand. Then either you're building Instagram, which you could be, and maybe that's what you're looking at, but much more likely for almost everybody who's here, you're gonna be looking at something that's over-architected. Some engineer has decided, hey, this would look good on my CV. Why don't I build a whole bunch of these things? I can tell you horror stories of engineers who have built stupendously complicated, amazingly scalable pieces of software for four users. And um, those four users were not well served by that. <laughs> they paid a lot, waited a long time, and didn't get a system that actually worked for them. So you're likely over-architected if the narrative is simple and the diagram is complex. But how about the other way around? If the diagram is simple and the narrative is complex. So you've got a diagram like this, but I'm telling you about all kinds of different horrible complexities that are in it then I'm probably hiding something. So I've made you a simple diagram, but I'm hiding very important information. I told you something about you know, 47 services around the world serving whatever this does. And uh, if, if that's the case, if that's what uh, this thing is actually doing, there's hidden complexity somewhere. I'm not gonna get that complex behavior out of a software system unless there's something hidden. So you better dig, find out more and get the engineer to draw you more of the detail. Where are those 46 services? I only count two on this diagram. What's going on here? And again, you don't have to understand what any of the pieces mean in order to get to this level of understanding. Now, the final one is if you have a very complicated diagram, you look at it and say, oh my God, my eyes hurt. This thing's just, uh, uh, you know, it's like somebody scattered ink all over the page. Uh, and the narrative is also complex. It's got all kinds of jargon. It's very uh, uh, sophisticated. It seems to be dealing with uh, huge amounts of users and uh, all kinds of use cases. Then you need an expert. So then you're probably not going to be able to get much from this. Uh, because you don't know whether you need to dig more or it's over-architected or you're dealing with some horribly complicated problem. So uh, I, I'd say get an expert, phone me, put something on the forum, uh, you know, get, get someone who can look at it in more detail for you because you're probably not going to get much from it. But in any of the other three cases, you can get a lot out of the diagram. Uh, and that's what I want to, to take you through. And I'm going to tell you some uh, uh, key questions and things to ask as you do that. Now, uh, if I stand up, I think it won't work as well. So I'm just going to try to do it from here. We'll see how this all works. Yeah, if this is hard to follow or anything, please complain in the comments and I will <laughs> attempt to improve. Um, but I, I think we've got good enough light and uh, that things are working. Laura, our community manager, will shout at me if, uh, if I'm being completely un unfollowable. So I'm going to tell you the narrative of this system. By the way, this is a real system. I've, I've anonymized it and, and changed things around and so on. But I took this from a real architecture diagram that I was looking at for a, a tech due diligence recently. Uh, I do that a lot for investors and, and for companies themselves who want to kind of health check on how their technology is running. So I'm doing a lot of this uh, all the time. And guess what? I don't understand a lot of the pieces, but I'm applying the rules that I'm, I'm showing you myself uh, so that I know when to dig and where to dig. So um, in this system, um, we're uh, serving um, some, some outside data. This is data that comes from the outside world um, and we're um, uh, uh, reflecting it in a helpful way. Um, this is information, um, let's say, uh, I wanna obscure the, uh, the client a little bit. So we're gonna say this is uh, information about uh, uh, logistics, um, where things are stored in a warehouse. Let's think about it that way. Uh, so you can think of this as a warehouse system. Um, there's lots of information that's coming from the warehouse. ABC stands for some kind of warehouse system that's telling you which warehouse your, uh, your items are stored in, how they're stored and so on. I remember doing this back in uh, 2014 with a warehouse that had, we had 5,000 5, new items coming in every week. Boy, it was a nightmare to keep track. So maybe this isn't as complicated as that because we have just one source of uh, warehouse information. Where are things being stored? 
and a really important thing to do is to start with humans. We want to go through and what you want to ask for the narrative is uh, what happens to a user? What do users actually do? So uh, this human being here is um, uh, going to be inquiring about uh, where something's stored or they're going to be saying, hey, please ship this to this person. They're going to be doing something with items that are stored in a warehouse. Um, and I'm going to skip over this one for a moment. But the, the user, see if I can do this. Hey, look, I can draw an arrow. The user sends a message in, and, and I might put browser on that. I'm not going to try with my uh, uh, ability to draw here uh, uh, too many uh, complicated bits on here. But uh, the user sends a message in by typing something in or uh, entering into a form or something like that. And uh, the message comes in saying, hey, where's uh, item number 47926? Um, and that hits a thing called a load balancer. This is something you'll encounter often. You don't have to know a lot about what a load balancer is, but uh, what it basically does, because you can see that from the arrows, see as I put in the arrows, it starts to make more sense, is it sends messages coming in from users to different app servers, different pieces of software that are running on uh, a part of the cloud. This is in DigitalOcean, uh, a particular cloud provider. Um, and uh, these app servers are dealing with the request. So um, and as they do that, they might need to look something up. So uh, they go to a database. Databases are almost always in architecture diagrams shown with a particular shape. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but this is a cylinder. Also, I'm not that great at drawing. So um, the databases, for whatever reason, are always cylindrical. Uh, I don't know that real databases are cylindrical. I've never seen a database in the real world, so I'm not sure why people draw it that way. Um, but uh, uh, these app servers might then send requests to the database. Say, hey, database, tell me if you know anything about uh, uh, item 47962 or whatever number I said. Um, so John Polo asks a good question. Uh, am I talking about use cases or user stories? I'm not really talking about either one. Right now, I'm talking about a narrative that describes where the data flows, what's happening to the data, the requests, the user's action. And, and so if a, um, uh, now that's not too far off from a user story because there is a bit of a story here. It's a narrative about the user who wants to find this item and ship it to a customer or uh, get it out of the warehouse or do whatever they want to do with it. And uh, so there is a bit of a story here, but it's not a user story in the kind of um, formal sense that many engineers and, and product people use where they say, as a user, I want to retrieve item X so that I can send it to a customer. That's a nice thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that kind of description. We're not trying to do that here. We want an interactive description where I'm drawing the arrows and helping you understand. My request started here, it went through the load balancer, which shares out the information, deals with uh, uh, sharing the load. Uh, it sends it to one of these app servers, and uh, those go get the information from the database. Right. So far, that's simple, but there's still a bunch of pieces that are, uh, are left out here. I haven't put arrows for other things. So uh, there could be jobs. And those are things running in the background. They might update from the warehouse when we do a stock count or something like that. So uh, jobs talk to the database as well. And then here's this outside source, which is giving us lots of information. And that's going to send information to the jobs. And perhaps it's going to update the database directly. I'm making this up. I don't know if this is a good architecture or not. But this outside service, which is um, uh, maybe keeping track of my actual uh, items in the warehouse. Uh, maybe there are robots running around in the warehouse checking where everything is. And they update the database to say, this is where you know we moved item 47962. Now it's over on the other side. So this guy tells the database, and the user comes along and asks. You see how much the arrows help with understanding how things flow. And we got the narrative of the user asking for the location of an item, the item being reported into the database. And then somehow out here, and it's very interesting that these things are out here. I'm going to mention where things are in a minute. Uh, there's uh, some kind of analysis that happens on the outside, so we can say what's statistically happening with our items, where are they being stored, what's being lost, whatever's happening. There's a, some kind of analysis tool out here, uh, and then there's Sentry, which is a common tool for um, monitoring errors. So then uh, developers might come along and look in there and say, ah, Squirrel asked for an, a non-existent object. He got an error. We need to help him with that. So uh, John Polo says, narrative implies dynamics. Yes, we're looking for the dynamics of the system. And that's really what Andrew's arrow axiom tells us. You can apply it in lots of places. Andrew applies it to the UN. I'm applying it to software architecture. But in any, any diagram that you might look at, if there are no arrows, if it's not clear how one piece is connected to another, how it flows and what happens over time, uh, then your diagram is uh, under, under specified. It's, it's not complicated enough. It doesn't give you enough information. 
So I'm suggesting this is how you can ask an engineer to give you a narrative and help you to understand how the pieces fit together. Now, um, the engineer you know, might use some things like ADC. What does that stand for? You're certainly welcome to ask that. You might understand um, uh, how does this work? What, uh, how is the, you know, are there robots running around? Are there people doing stop counts? What's the, the source of this? You can start to see how you could ask very natural questions about how these pieces fit together. Now, I've left something out intentionally here. Um, let me fill it in now. So this is LLM, which is a uh, large language model. Um, and we all know that is uh, chat GPT or Bard or uh, I forget what all the other ones are, are named Llama. They have uh, silly, fun names. So I've introduced that as another way that the user might interact with the system. And uh, what I want to underline for all of these is the location, like the physical location of these items is very important. It's particularly important for this one, which I'll come back to. So as somebody is drawing these arrows for you, it's very helpful to understand our users are mainly in Portugal because that's where our main customers are. And we have people in Portugal there. And our warehouse is in the United States. And the database is in Australia. Well, if that's the case, you can immediately notice there might be something wrong here. This might be, if you think about the speed of light, uh, there's a limit on how fast uh, that information could travel. And you might see why your users in Portugal are a little bit sad. Now, that's an exaggerated example of the locations. But you notice I've put up here DigitalOcean. That's a particular cloud provider. And by the way, this I've, I've tried to draw a cloud here. I'm not good at it. But in a, in a good diagram, you would be able to see that this is a sort of cloud uh, picture here. Um, so there's most often people are storing this kind of information in cloud providers these days because we mostly outsource to Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, uh, a few smaller players like DigitalOcean, um, uh, Hetzner, places like that, that that are providing these kind of off-the-shelf um, services where the engineers don't have to manage the servers themselves. They don't have to go walk over to something and plug it in and put in a new uh, disk drive and, and other sorts of things physically to make the machine work. That's all done virtually and managed for them by people running big data centers. And, and that is a huge cost saving. But uh, a common kind of mistake is you'll have many different cloud providers all over the place. You have some DigitalOcean and some AWS and Google Cloud Platform and something else in China. And, and, and when you start asking about where these things are, um, the engineers might say they don't know, which is a big red flag. Yeah, it's in AWS somewhere. I don't know where AWS puts it. Don't accept that. AWS has regions, and those regions tell you where things are stored. And for instance, that has regulatory and legal complications, right? Because if uh, here in Europe, we have certain privacy protections. In the United States, they don't have quite the same privacy protection. China has a completely different view on all these things. So uh, if these things are in the, the wrong location physically, you can have uh, legal and financial problems. And the engineers may ignore that. So of course, the engineer, it's just a, a, an item on the screen. It's a drop down. You say, put this here. So knowing where something is is important for legal and regulatory reasons. And here's a big important one of those, which lots of people are making mistakes with right now. So um, I read this wonderful story. And it was all about um, this doctor. It was really heartwarming. And it really made me excited until it made me terrified. It was about this doctor in a, a very busy emergency ward, uh, accident in an emergency, as we'd say here in Britain. And this doctor said, look, I'm really overloaded. And, and every night uh, I have to explain things to lots and lots of people um, because they're very worried about their relatives who are here in the hospital. And, and I need to deal with the patients. I need to like, cure the patients so they don't die. And I got all these people bugging me. And I found a great solution. My great solution is to um, write a really short uh, description for chat GPT of the patient's condition. And I did this for, for this one particular patient. I wrote down what this patient's condition was in medical language. And I said, please write a little note that explains what this is all about uh, so that I can hand it to the, uh, the, the patient's family. And uh, boom, out of his printer came a nice little description of this patient's condition. And uh, he was able to hand it to the family. And the family, being very worried, could always come back to that. They'd asked him a lot of questions over and over. And he said, just look at page three. You know, Have a look at this. And, and it really helped. But then I realized. <laughs> that there are these rules about sharing information about patients. And what happens is you notice this LLM is not within the, the domain where our main application is running. Information, if it's passing this way, or if our users are putting it in, that's going to somebody we don't know. And if we're dealing with healthcare information, financial information, pr private, uh, personally identifiable information, we may be in a world of trouble sending this data to somebody we shouldn't. So although you might not coming into this know what an LLM is, 
you might say to yourself, where is that, and why is it not inside our main uh, uh, database, where, where, or, sorry, our main uh, cloud provider? It may be absolutely innocent. That might be perfectly fine, but it's the sort of thing that the engineers should be thinking about, and they might not, because we're not so great at legal stuff. We're, we're better at making cool stuff, uh, generally. So um, one of the questions as you're getting the narrative, as someone is talking you through the life cycle of a request and where all the data goes and how it goes back to the user, ask, we always be asking, where are things? Is this in the warehouse? Are the robots moving around and, and measuring things? Uh, is the database in the same physical location as the rest of this? Is it all just sort of in the cloud, but you don't know where? So if you know the physical locations, uh, it'll really help you to understand where there might be challenges in the system. Um, so another thing is that engineers should be able to, by the way, ask me questions, argue with me, uh, make comments. Uh, John Polo and, uh, and Ryan have been great doing that. Please, please keep doing that. I'd love more questions and comments. So um, uh, uh, after a brief drink, I'm going to tell you another very important question to ask uh, when you're going through a narrative with an engineer. So another super important thing to ask is what technology are you using? Now, you may not understand the answer. It's not that important to understand precisely what they're saying. If they say, we're using Java version 9, uh, it's tied up to Spring Boot. Uh, uh, we're using Spring Boot because it gives us so many uh, opportunities to automate the uh, testing process. Some of that may go over your head. That's OK, because the question isn't, what's the technology, but why did you choose it? And what benefits and costs does it have? So uh, a client I was working with um, recently had chosen a relatively obscure programming language. Uh, it was one, you know, you might have heard of programming languages like JavaScript or Python, um, uh, and, and those are kind of well-known. They'd chosen one that was a little more off the wall, uh, and not so many people uh, used it. And, and when I asked the engineers, why did you choose this? They said, well, because we think it's really a good language for this problem. You know, it, it does make it really hard to hire because there's about 200 people in our city who know this programming language, and we've hired 10 of them. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, you're, you're, you're running out of people to hire there. How about how many people are there who know these more popular languages? Oh, tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands um, uh, are, are available on the market for these. By asking what the programming language was and why they had chosen it, um, I was able, and, and what challenges it gave them, I was able to discover pretty quickly uh, that they'd made a, a suboptimal choice. Now, that may not be evident to you. It might not be easy to do um, because they, they may throw a lot of different pieces of jargon with you, at you. But if you can break them down by components, so you say, all right, so what's the app server running? OK, it's running uh, uh, Python using Django. OK, uh, how many people can uh, service that? Are you finding any difficulties with using that platform? Well, it's, it's an old version. You know, We haven't updated the version for a long time. So it's out of support. And when we have problems, it's harder for us to get people to help us. Ah, OK, now we found another problem. Um, if they say, uh, well, the database is um, uh, MySQL, and uh, the biggest problem we have with that, the biggest, uh, you know, the reason we chose it is because it's simple, but the problem we have is it's not scaling very well. Then you know you have a, a problem with uh, how many uh, users can be serviced by that database. And you notice there's only one of it. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. How do you know whether things are scaling well? So uh, the fact that there's only one of it might tell you, might be another hint that there's some kind of scaling problem that might not be able to handle large spikes in volume and, and uh, lots of requests from users. So this question, asking this question, what are you using and why, can give you a lot of insight into the, um, uh, the thinking of the developers. Now, when you ask the why question, they may also say, I don't know. <laughs> I found it when I got here. Um, uh, So-and-so who doesn't work here anymore uh, seemed to like it. Um, uh, I don't know. It seems to work. We haven't really questioned it. Those are all big red flags, right? We haven't really thought about it. That's where you might, again, start thinking about getting an expert to look for whether you're overcomplicating things. You know, are we building using the software that just happens to be there? Or have we really thought through why it's there? To the credit of the people who had picked the uh, unusual programming language, they had thought about it. They had good arguments for why that was a good programming language. Problem was they hadn't thought so carefully about how many people were available to, to work in it. So that was a bigger problem for them. OK, um, now I've also uh, thrown out here this uh, notion there's some kind of analysis tool. This could be a looker or a snowflake or things like that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these different tools that give you visualizations of, of the data that you're working with. Again, you want to ask, where is this and why have we chosen it? Does it fit our needs? Uh, what um, uh, alternatives exist out there? And uh, should we be sending our data out to the, some other service? Um, often you will find um, when you're over here in the, the complex diagram world, 
that there'll be a whole lot of services used and nobody's quite sure what they do. And we're not sure we really need them. And um, they're leaking our data all over the place uh, and probably costing us a bunch as well. So all those questions can help you to generate a very useful conversation. Back to John Polo's point. I'm mean, definitely going to talk about conversations. That's me. Uh, 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 a very useful conversation about how people got to these choices without you necessarily having to understand uh, the detailed technical analysis. Why did you choose this one? How is it technically better? Well, what's it, what's better about it for users? How much does it cost us? Where's the data going? This is a very uh, productive conversation you can have based on a diagram like this. Now, I'm going to mention just one more thing, then I'm going to stop for questions. Um, and if you don't have any, then we'll just stop early before somebody comes and throws me out of this room. Um, uh, and that is uh, this notion of scaling. So uh, one way your diagram can be complex, but a little easier to understand, is if there are lots of copies of things. So you notice there's the same thing here three times. Now, why would you have the same thing three times? Well, it's the same reason that when you go to the grocer and you want to check out and you want to buy your groceries, you have a number of choices. You can go to the self-service lane where you can scan it yourself. You can go talk to a person. There's probably four or five of those people. Um, there might be some other uh, uh, options, you know, where somebody, um, uh, mine has a sort of, my grocer has a sort of loyalty thing where you can scan things and get more points and things. Uh, so there's a number of different choices. And when a whole bunch of people all come to check out their groceries at the same time, they don't wait in a big queue. And it's exactly the same principle. When you see the same thing over and over again in a diagram, that means somebody is thinking about trying to scale. Now, that's not always good. You might think, oh, it's good if we're able to handle more users. No, not always. Uh, I actually um, uh, am doing a, a, a due diligence now. It's one reason that I'm, I'm here in this building um, uh, here in London rather than at home. And, and as I'm doing that one, one of the key questions that I got from the CEO is uh, uh, why are we building quite so many complicated things? Because we have more stuff, and I'm, I'm kind of worried we're going to be over-architecting. Because actually, we're not going to have that many users, and am I paying too much for my hosting? Am I paying uh, more than I need to? Am I delaying my software? Could I be building it faster if I didn't try to handle quite so many uh, possible incoming users? So being more scalable is not necessarily better, but what you can definitely detect from the diagram is somebody is thinking about how to scale in one particular place because you notice there's only one database here. So this is like if um, all the different checkouts at the grocer had uh, uh, the same cash register. So there might be different places for you to put your groceries down and for the person to scan them and so on. But when it comes time to pay, everybody has to go to the same till and, and actually hand over cash or a card or whatever it is that you're doing. You can imagine that might not work so well uh, the day before Christmas, right? When everybody's in the grocer trying to buy their Christmas goodies and so on. And um, suddenly everyone has to wait for the same item. Now, uh, engineers will do all kinds of things. This is a great discussion for you to have with them. Why is there only one database? Well, it makes it easier to sync. Uh, we don't have to do complicated things with it. And this database is actually very large. It's very it, capable of handling the simple requests that are coming from this app, these application servers. That's the case in this, this actual diagram I based this on. Because I asked exactly that question. Hey, wait a minute. How does this scale? Well, it scales because it's a big machine and there are very simple requests coming from these. So it can handle it, and we've proven that. That's a great answer. I'm quite happy with that. And also, this application also does not handle gigantic volumes. They're not expecting uh, zillions of people to be tracing um, the items in the warehouse in, in their example. Um, but in another case, you might be building an e-commerce website, and Black Friday comes around, and you get loads and loads of people in the, the grocery queues looking at each of these application servers, and they're making their requests, and they're trying to buy their things, and everybody has to go to the same till. And that's how you get things crashing on uh, Black Friday, uh, Taylor Swift, Swifties going and trying to buy tickets. They're all doing it at the same time. And somebody hasn't provisioned enough machines uh, to, to handle the, the large load that they're getting. So these are the sorts of conversations that you can trigger so that you can gauge whether the engineers have thought through these issues. You're probably not going to be able to solve them if you're not a technical person. That's OK. I'm not trying to teach you how to solve technological problems or how to design your own architecture. What I'm trying to do is, is give you the tools that you can use to have a meaningful discussion that will help you to decide what, where you fit. So um, are we pretty simple, and we're doing a simple job, and hey, we're kind of OK. That, that we're, we don't have to do very much. Is there a chance we're over-architecting because we made something too complicated? We're dealing with uh, volumes. We're not doing Taylor Swift tickets. We're doing uh, Squirrel tickets. Those, you know, I don't sell that many as, as Taylor Swift, although maybe I would like to someday. Um, no, I would not. 
Um, <laughs> or are we doing a simple thing, but what we're, we're kind of making it more complex than we need to. We're describing it in a complex way, confusing new, new joiners, confusing the, the, the executives. Or, hey, we just got something really messy and we need some help. So if I can get you to the right quadrant here, then I've, I've done my job because uh, I want to help you have that productive conversation instead of just looking at something like this and saying, oh, my God, I have no idea what's going on here. This is just Martian to me. So I, I hope I've been successful in doing that. John Polo is back, uh, says one of the difficulties is uh, execs don't understand that what drives architecture design is non-functional requirements. Oh, one of my favorite um, phrases for a couple of reasons. I'll explain that in a second. How would you suggest to overcome that gap? Okay. So... Um, now, non-functional requirements is a kind of fancy piece of jargon. Don't be scared by it. Um, uh, requirement is a term actually I try really hard not to use. I say request because in almost no cases is something a requirement. Now, there are legal requirements. There are things you must do for regulatory reasons. And there are moral requirements. You know, it would be bad if we stored passwords uh, without encrypting them so it was easy for someone to hack into our database. So um, you know, there, there, there are real requirements, but very, very rarely do things that come from customers really uh, require our attention and that we must do them. They're requests. They're things people would like us to do. So rephrasing this as a non-functional request, what does non-functional mean? It means it's not actually benefiting the user, which is why I don't really like this phrase because in fact, the kinds of things that fit in this category, these are things like scalability. We've just been talking about that. How can we make it ha the system handle lots and lots of requests? Um, uh, uh, things like usability. Um, uh, uh, just making it simple to get to what, what it is you want to work with. Um, maintainability, that's a great one because engineers can hide almost anything behind maintainability. It's hard to maintain. We've got to replace everything. You know, we'll see you in six months. Uh, very, very easy to, to um, uh, misuse that one. Um, and there are lots of other things. They're sometimes called the illities because a lot of them end in illity. Um, and uh, 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 the the uh, adjective you're trying to describe, you're, you're, you're trying to make sure your software has this adjective that is, is described in this way, um, that can be hard to capture for a user, exactly as John Polo says. And an engineer will say, hey, wait a minute, if, if I don't build the software uh, in, in a particular way that I, that I know, then we're going to have a problem in six months. And, and I know that problem is uh, a maintenance problem. I know that what's going to be hard is a, a configurability problem. Let's do that one because I was just talking to someone about that too. Um, uh, you want your software to be uh, changeable. You want a user to be able to go in and say, hey, wait a minute, my warehouse is, is running differently. I, I'm not at the ABC warehouse. I'm at the DEF warehouse and it runs differently. So I want to configure things and make it stored in a different way. That's a good thing. Configurability is a um, generally good characteristic. But it's hard to capture that for a user. A user might say, well, I know how my warehouse works. My IT people are going to configure it. I don't really care. Uh, and so this is a non-functional requirement for me, this configurability idea. So why don't you not do it? And I think that's what John Paul is referring to, is that um, uh, he might be busy building an architecture like this. And somebody says, man, uh, John Polo, uh, we got these three app servers here. Boy, that seems really complicated and expensive. Uh, hey, could we not do that? How about if we just have one? And um, John Polo, the thing I would suggest to you is that you not talk about non-functional requirements or even about things like configurability or scalability. Tell a story. So go back to your narrative and say, well, um, one thing that might happen to us is a whole bunch of people come and try to store their, their items in our, data, in, our, in our warehouse. And when lots of them come at the same time, maybe they're all going to take their items out to go on summer vacation or something like that. Or we're going to have a big sale on Black, Black Friday. We're going to ship a lot of things to customers. I'm not sure what you're putting in your warehouse that I'm imagining. But as you tell that story, you can say, and if we don't have these three, the result will be that they have to wait a long time. Now, uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, I, I, I told a tale like that to, um, uh, uh, to a big um, financial services excuse me, a financial services firm. And that uh, company, which we were building software for, um, uh, real, had these people in India whose job was, it was overnight, while uh, people in, uh, uh, in, at the home office were sleeping, they would type in lots and lots of information. And we gave them a screen into which they typed this information. And uh, those uh, poor people in India, we had built the screen really badly. And, and we knew that, and we had really underserved them. And, and so what we noticed was as we watched the logs and we could see what they were doing, we would see that they would put in the data and then they would um, uh, uh, wait a long time for something to acknowledge. Yes, your data has been saved, right? So you can imagine writing an email and you click send and you have to wait five minutes. 
uh, and we imagine them going off and I'm not sure whether they drink coffee or tea or something else, but, you know, having a bunch of sips of, of tea and then going and getting some more and then saying, finally, okay, now I can type the next thing. And we said to the financial services firm, we said, you're paying these people by the hour. Uh, th this has to be a problem for you. And by the way, it's really frustrating to them. We can see how frustrating it is and it really slows them down. So don't worry, we're going to fix this for you. And the response I got, I will never forget, it was a very vigorous response. And it, it was put in a not very nice way, but I'll put it in a nice way. They said, uh, we're happy for those folks to, to wait. Uh, we, we don't pay them a, a wage that concerns us. They aren't complaining to us. Um, we, we really uh, don't need to service those people because uh, we hire them to type things in at whatever speed the software allows it. And it happens while we're sleeping. So if it takes them seven hours instead of four, uh, that's okay with us because we just want to see it in the morning. And what we want you to do instead, Squirrel, is make us even more beautiful reports so we can sell more of our services to our clients. And guess what? We built better services. So that was a case where there was a, a, what I thought was a non-functional requirement. Um, it was one that I thought these people were sort of passively making by <laughs> sitting there and sipping their, their tea while they waited for these um, uh, very, very slow screens we had built for them. But in fact, it was no request at all. It wasn't a requirement. It wasn't something that we had to do. And although I thought it was a non-functional requirement, it absolutely wasn't. So John Paul, I would encourage you to have that kind of conversation. And, and again, I keep coming back to it. If you can tell the story, you can describe what's happening. And I could describe the story with the T and the, the poor person sitting there, you know, typing away and then waiting. Um, that, that actually made it come to life for the uh, people who were paying for the software. And they could say, actually, I'm happy with that. I don't want to change that. And I don't want to make a, uh, an improvement in that area. I want to make an improvement in another area. And at the end of the day, that was the best thing for that company and, and for the people who were getting paid in India because the, the, the service, the company needed to grow in order for them to, uh, to continue to have jobs. So uh, I hope that's helpful, John Paul. Uh, uh, that kind of narrative is really what can drive a, a very effective uh, conversation. Okay, if you have more questions, please tell me, but I'm gonna tell you where to get in touch with me more and how to find out more about uh, more such events like this one. Uh, we have them every Thursday, except next week, uh, we're not doing one um, because uh, I'm taking a nice little break, uh, which is going to be fun. Uh, I'm going to uh, visit uh, uh, Paris with my wife, um, but after that, we're coming back with one you really don't wanna miss, and that's a, a, another free live stream just like this one with Joanna Rothman, who is an amazing expert on software management. Uh, she's gonna have her own view on, on these kinds of questions. So you wanna come back and ask more about architecture, that would be great. But she also knows how to lead engineers, um, how to, um, uh, uh, to make sure they have the right processes in place. And that's what we're mainly going to talk about is this notion that agile software development can be faked. And there are things that kind of feel like it's agile and you read the book and it says, this is agile software development and it doesn't have the characteristic, the adjective, of Agile. In other words, it takes you forever to get anything done. And Joanna's uh, written a whole book about that topic and, um, you know, it's something I rant on about uh, all the time. So I'd uh, love for you to come back. The way to sign up for that or anything else on the squadron is right here on the screen, uh, squirrelsquadron.com. By the way, if you're having fun listening to this, if you find this helpful, you know, John Polo and, and uh, Julia and, and uh, Ryan have all been here and they're following me all the time, I know. If you know, if you find this interesting, would you please share? Would you please tell more people about the squadron? I'd really appreciate that. Could just be a tweet. It could be telling your friend. It could be bringing it up in your Slack at your at your company. Anything you can do to share is helpful. We already have thousands of people in the squadron, but I'd like to get to get to tens of thousands because if we can do more sharing and more uh, information uh, gathering, uh, that this will become even more valuable. So, um, you know, we were just, I was telling you before, <clears throat> we had a conversation on the forum between uh, Julia here in the UK and, uh, uh, and Asaf, a, a really great product expert in, um, uh, in Australia. And they wouldn't have come together if we hadn't created the squadron and an opportunity for them to get together. So please share if you can, uh, it's something that really helps us out uh, in uh, growing the community and, and helping us to have greater, uh, more expertise. Super, and uh, no more questions. Uh, and I haven't been thrown out of the office yet, so uh, it looks like we're gonna uh, close just a couple minutes early. And I hope this has been helpful to you. The recording will be available if you wanna share it with your friends, uh, wanna ask more questions. If you're watching on the recording, come on over to the forum or drop me an email. I'd love to answer questions from you if you have them. And I hope everybody has an absolutely wonderful day. Take care. <laughs>